And hello again, this is Jean Anderson. Uh, welcome to the seventh annual Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. Um, as I said, I'm Jean, I'm with the South Central Library System and I am moderating the small and mighty track. Assisting me today is Leah Langby with the IFLIS Library System and we are so glad to have you here. Our presenter for this session is Marianne Mori with the State Library of Iowa, and she will be discussing transforming big ideas into small library environments. If you have questions during the webinar, feel free to use your questions panel every time, and uh, Marianne and I, all of us, will be moderating them. If you, um, and then Marianne, whenever you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Okay, well, thank you for the opportunity to be here today. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't seem I'm able to see your questions, but I know that Leah and Jean will keep an eye on those, and I do like to have a very interactive session. So, Leah and Jean, you're going to have to really pay attention because I'll be asking some questions myself that I want the audience to answer. Uh, I am one of six reach a district consultants for the state library we have more consultants who stay in the office but i'm one of those consultants who's on the road and my uh, district has 13 counties 99 public libraries in it 106 locations with a few branch uh, libraries in it and we know about small libraries in iowa because we have 544 public libraries in our state and 47 percent of those libraries are located in towns with populations of less than a thousand people so this presentation was originally presented for the state of iowa and i did this with three other panelists all of uh, whom are directors of small libraries you can see them here so i do want to get give them credit where credit is due. And some of the slides and information that I'm sharing will be coming from their libraries and from the presentations they had as part of that panel presentation a few years ago. So here's our direction for the day. I'll give you a little background information talking about small and what that actually means. And then we'll look at some suggestions and applications uh, and uh, share some resources and have plenty of time at the end then for questions and answers. And please do post your questions in the chat box, even though I'm not actually seeing those. Jean and Leah, as I said, will be keeping track of those. At the State Library here in Iowa, we do something that I'm sure your State Library does, and that is after every presentation, every training event that we do, we offer some kind of a survey in order to get feedback. And in one particular session that we led, and that was about a, a summer reading training that we did as a live face-to-face -face presentation, and we had gone to a lot of trouble to do this and had excellent presenters come in and do it. Some of the feedback we got said things like, well, those are great ideas from a, a big library, but I'm a small library, so I can't. They have space and I don't, so I can't do that. And they have staff and I'm the only person working in my library, so I can't. Or they have a big budget and I have no money, so I can't. And over and over again, we heard this can't theme. So we determined that we needed to help show our librarians how they can take these bigger ideas and convert them into smaller environments. So that's the background on, as to how this presentation developed. And what I hope to do for you today is eliminate this word can't from your vocabulary. This is kind of an aside and I tossed this in fairly late in the game, but it was such a, an interesting story and a good comment. I just loved it and had to share it. I was talking with a non-librarian friend, mind you, non-librarian friend, uh, and just mentioned that I was preparing a presentation about uh, big ideas working well in small libraries. And this friend very innocently said, what's the difference between a big library and a small library? I have a big dog and I have a small dog and they both bark. I thought, what a great analogy, because all of our libraries, regardless of size, if they're small, if they're big, if they're in between, they can all bark. And that is, they can all serve their purpose. They can all serve their community. So keep that in mind the next time you're a little discouraged and think you can't do something that a larger library can do. Just remember, you can still bark. This is another good quote that I encourage you to keep in mind. This is from a 2004 American Libraries article, which is quite good. You can see the citation there at the bottom of the slide. But the quote from this is, small is not the same as less. And Jean and Leah, this is where I'm going to ask you to pay attention to the chat box because I want you, the audience, tell me, what do you see as the difference between small and less? How is small not the same as less? Wait All right, use your, yes. Yeah, go ahead. <clears throat> go ahead and put your um, comments in the question box and I will read them out. I'm just waiting for them to come in. Anything coming in yet, Jean? No, not yet. 
I think ah. they're typing furiously. Or maybe they're eating their lunch. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here we come. We have buildings, we have collections, we have patrons. Yeah. So kind of that you still bark, right? Yes. And passion. Oh, definitely. Good. Sometimes at a small library, you can offer more personalized service than a large library could. Quantity is not quality. Ah, very good. A good quote. Mm -hmm. Small means stronger relationships. Mm -hmm. In a previous session where I've done this, somebody said less has more of a negative connotation than small. And I kind of have to agree with that, I think. Uh, yep, I would agree with that. Yeah. Well, let's move on here and keep your comments coming. Um, many of you may be old enough to remember this little character, Mighty Mouse, small but mighty, right? And that's what our small libraries is. So again, let's get rid of this can't and let's think about what can our small libraries do. There is a wonderful article titled, A Small Library with Big Ideas. And the author is the director of the Myrtle Library in Missouri. And I don't know if any of you are familiar with this location, but this particular library is only 632 square feet. That's small, right? <laughs> I think we would all agree. And the, the entire, entire county where this library is located has 10,000 people. That's not for the city, that's for the entire county. But this author makes a really good observation and she says her library is 25 miles from the nearest Red Box, two hours away from the nearest Barnes and Noble, and they are the only publicly accessible broadband within 25 miles. So one of the advantages of your small library is you're it. You're there, you're in the community. Whereas if you're like a lot of our small libraries here in Iowa, you have to drive quite a distance to get to anything else. So keep that in mind that you are there and you're available. This is also from that same article and the director says, most recently I added a puppet theater for the kids and we're working with our regional office of the Department of Conservation to start a fishing pool and tackle loaner program next month because their library is located near a river. So remember, this is a 632 square foot building. If they can do this in their small library, think of what you can do in yours. There's a, coming from that same article I mentioned in an earlier slide where small is not the same as less. Here's another good quote from that one that says, being small cuts both ways and talks about the disadvantages, but also the advantages. So again, type in the chat box, what are the advantages of being in a small library? One of you said earlier, uh, something about you can know your patrons, and that's definitely a, a, a plus of being in a smaller environment. What else is an advantage of being in a small library? Um, I'm taking this one from the question before, but uh, more browsable collections. Oh, yeah. Um, let, let's see. More personal interactions, more mm -hmm. autonomy. Yeah, fewer hoops to jump through, right? Mm-hmm. Small libraries get to really use their creativity. We can try out new ideas without jumping through hoops. We know our patrons really well. We know your patrons by name. You know what they like to read and what their informational needs are. Right. In one small library where I used to take my kids, one of the librarians would hold back some of the new books that came in. She probably wasn't <laughs> supposed to do that. But uh, and she would give them to one of my kids. Oh, I know you like horses. We just got this brand new horse book in. And that would never happen in a big library. No. Uh, we can tailor our programs to their needs. Mm -hmm. uh, we have relevant collection for the taste of our patrons, as you just were Wonderful. talking about. Wonderful. Um, and very personalized service to our members. Yeah, well, keep those comments coming in. Here's what the article mentions as some of the advantages. Even though you're small, the people in your community still know what's going on in the world, right? So they're still capable of having interesting discussions, and they're still interested in education and learning and growing. Um, so it doesn't mean you're all living under a rock by any means. Uh, connections can be made quickly, both with your patrons and with some other organizations. And those organizations that are in your community are usually extremely interwoven, so it's very easy to partner and work together. And then we kind of mentioned this earlier about the lack of hoops. You have a good idea, you just run with it. You don't have to have a committee and a subcommittee and, and work on it for months, you just do it. So in the essence of time, I'm going to focus on three areas as we think about small, and you can see what those are here. Uh, let's start out with programs. It's often tricky to do programs in a small library because uh, I'm assuming your libraries, are, small libraries are like the small libraries I'm working with. Many of them do not have a designated meeting room. 
So when they want to do a program, space is always a real um, problem, and we'll we'll look at spaces in a moment. But programming is often hard to do because of that, um, and also because there are many times a one-person library, meaning there's the director and that's it. And if the director is doing a program, who's going to run the desk? Who's going to answer the phone? Who's going to help other patrons that come in? So. Um, some of the problems that I've identified and that many small library staff say are problematic to doing programs are having enough staff, having enough money, space, and then time to prepare for those programs. Now, believe it or not, I, I've worked in a large library system, multi-branch system. Many of these same problems still exist there. So don't think that these are unique just to small libraries. They're probably more prevalent in small libraries, but they often exist equally in large libraries. And one large library system for which I worked, um, I was designated as the teen specialist librarian, and I was told, oh, and your budget is zero. So <laughs> just because it was a really big library did not mean I had money to work with. So some ways that you can get by um, and change these problems into solutions Utilize volunteers. I really hope you've got a good volunteer policy, application process, and uh, uh, defense line of volunteers at your library that you can utilize. Consider some do-it-yourself ideas, and I'll share a really creative one here in just a minute. As far as the money, go with donations. Ask for what you want, and I'll talk more about that in a later slide. Consider going craftless. I've just been presenting some summer reading program webinars here in, in my state. And uh, it was interesting to to tell some of these youth services librarians it's okay to go craftless. I kind of felt like a, a renegade for doing that. But you don't have to have a craft to have a successful program. Crafts are great if you can do them and you've got the supplies, but don't think you have to do that uh, if you if you think you're going to have a successful program and have to have a craft. No, that's not true. Consider doing things off-site, another location, or right there in the stacks. And that's the picture here. Uh, that you see this is a very small library in my district and they are doing their kids program right smack dab in front of the circ desk because that's the only place they have and then utilize some volunteers as well as we mentioned earlier to do your prep time in one of the libraries where I worked we had two retired preschool teachers who would come in I think every week they showed up it was a social time for them and then they would do all of our craft preparation for that library which did utilize crafts uh, somebody has said that they utilize board members, which is nice. That's a great way to get your board involved, definitely. Here's this creative do-it-yourself idea that I said I would share with you. Do-it-yourself story time. Um, this is a mid-sized library, and they offered this on, I don't know if they do it every Saturday, but many Saturdays when they don't have as much staff working and when they can't do a full-fledged story time is when they utilize these. Now you're going, how on earth do you do a do-it-yourself story time? And I'm so glad you asked because let me show you. I contacted the Youth Services Librarian there, and this is what she said, so I'm just going to read straight from her answer. She says, the weekend story time has worked well for us. We gather picture books, easy readers, nonfiction, and board books for a theme, and we place them in a basket with a stand-up letter telling about the books and asking families to read together. There is a craft to do that goes along with the theme. I will have to tell you about last Saturday, she says. I was working. And a little gal who comes to weekday story time came to the library with her dad. She asked, Miss Diana, are you going to have story time? I informed her that I was not. However, there was a do-it-yourself story time. Her dad then said, Daddy will do story time today. And I think that's so wonderful to think, here's a dad. Many of us realize they're sometimes hard to get into these programs and read to their kids who is going to assume the role as the storyteller and read with his child and do an interactive craft with his child um, doing it themselves. So that's just kind of fun, I think. I like that. Um, I'm just going back at, at some of the chat that um, Leah and Jean are providing to me. And uh, one of you talks about having things on wheels. Yep, you're going to see that in just a minute in one of my slides. Here's another interesting idea. This comes from a blog post where the author was uh, transferring some information that came out of the Texas Library Association. It was all about a program known as Tale Tellers. And this was where the library took teens and trained them, notice that part, trained them on how to lead a story time. 
and the library that did this talked about what a wonderful program it was because it allowed them to have programs that they otherwise would not have been able to do. They were able to reach hundreds of kids that they otherwise would not have been able to reach. And it truly empowered the teens. And they, they took over this program, if you will. And it became self-sustaining because the teens who had been trained to do it were very enthusiastic about training yet another group of teens to come in behind them to do it. I have to say this photograph did not come from that, um, but it kind of ties in with that program. So the way that they did this was they first recruited the students. They then met with the students and their parents to emphasize the importance and the seriousness of the project. And then they hired or recruited someone to do formal training with these students to teach them best ways to read stories and how to incorporate, I'm sure, uh, early uh, literacy activities and how to do the crafts and et cetera. So it, it was operated by the teens. What an interesting program, I think. Uh, this is a fairly new idea I just learned about from one of the libraries here in Iowa that they're doing where they um, partner with a hospital and they have read, uh, read to your baby before the baby's born and this is for expectant parents and they talk about the importance of literacy and uh, the pre-reading skills and activities that they can do with their baby and they do all of this for the expectant parents as I said now if you don't have a hospital or you don't have a lot of expectant parents in your town this would be a great opportunity to partner county-wide or region-wide and I believe uh, this program gives a book to every new baby that's born in that area so it's, um, they have resources online, too, that you can access. Let's move on now and talk about space. Uh, for this purpose, I'm going to focus on teen spaces because I hear so often from youth services librarians how they wish they could incorporate a teen space into their library, but there's just no room. A few years ago, I did a presentation that was all about teen spaces, and I gathered photographs from libraries of various sizes here in my state. And we just looked at them and talked about how big it was, what it cost, what they implemented. And it was a way to give ideas to other youth services staff. So this was one of the examples from a larger library. And you can see the price tag that was for this teen space. And you can see the size. That's not for the entire library. That's for the teen space alone. Now, if you're a small library, you look at this and go, oh, I don't have that kind of money. I don't have that kind of space. I could never do that. But think now, what could you do, looking at this photograph, what could you do with this teen space that you could still incorporate into a small library environment? Post this in the chat. What are one or two ideas you could take away from this? Chairs or posters, Patty says. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Yeah, even the poster's kind of cool, and even small libraries can afford something like that. You a talk about Is that a whiteboard, whiteboard on the back? I think it might be, yeah, because it looks like they've got the eraser stuff there, too. So mm -hmm. putting up whiteboard on yeah. a wall. And you uh, mentioned the chairs, and you look at this, and they've got, what, five or six stools in the picture, and you go, well, maybe I could get one of those. I like the stool mm -hmm. concept. Yes, maker space for all ages, a recording studio, book sale, project space, copy machine, um, uh, cool seating arrangements, um, love the built-in bench, right? Uh, a special rug. Yeah, that can make a difference. I think some of you have peeked at my slides in advance because <laughs> here's an example of taking a rug and taking the color scheme from that other example. and using it in a smaller library setting. Much lower price tag, much less space required, but it's still a cool area. You'd be amazed at what a rug can do to offset an area. Here's another teen space. I uh, put this one in here because this was done, uh, it's kind of busy, but it's definitely eye-catching. Can't miss it. I, I like this idea because it was done by people in the community. The, the iPad mural on the back that was done by the local art teacher and then the table the coffee table that you see in the foreground there was done by art students in the community by teens so it kind of gave some buy-in and there again it's just the rug and the wall painting they did utilize these banners to kind of help offset things as well this is from a mid-sized library but still very limited budget and the youth services librarian at that time got some donated ceiling tiles and bought some tempura paints and had the teens each paint a tile. 
then she got the public works guys to come in and put these tiles in the ceiling in a designated spot to offset the teen area. Cost was less than $50. So that's a really simple way to create a teen space. Here we go, the furniture on wheels. I tell all of the libraries in my district, if they're thinking of doing any kind of remodeling or rebuilding or refurnishing, get it on wheels. This is a very small library and they wanted to incorporate a teen area when they did a renovation, but unfortunately in their renovation, they weren't getting any additional space. So what they did was they put it on wheels and their shelving for their teen collection, you can see is on wheels and whenever they want to do any kind of programming, they unlock the wheels, push those shelves out of the way, and then they've got a nice uh, area that's suitable for setting up chairs or for doing more active activities. So let's go on now and look at makerspace ideas because I think some of you were jumping onto that concept uh, in our past discussion here. So makerspaces, this is what most people think of when they think of makerspace, big, fancy, expensive. This is coming from Cincinnati, so obviously they've got some really cool stuff here. You don't have to have all the high-tech, fancy, expensive, large 3D printer kind of stuff. There is an article that uh, is still available online, I just checked, and it's titled, How to Make a $100 Makerspace for Your Library. And here are some of the comments from that author. When it comes to creating a makerspace, large amounts of creativity can easily overcome not having large amounts of money. With the proper mindset, even a ream of office paper can provide a library makerspace with endless possibilities. The maker movement is about embracing the limitless creative potential in everyday objects. Think junk. And I'll show you a slide about that in a, a little later. She has the maker movement is about more than technology. Don't feel like you need iPads or laptops or 3D printers to create a successful makerspace. I tell librarians that if you're doing a knitting program, and that's a pretty popular program right now in libraries, for that moment, those people in the corner of your library knitting, they have created a makerspace in that corner. So makerspace can connotate a lot of things. Uh, this article author also says, instead of uh, spending money on big equipment, focus on spending your money on essential things. Scissors are always needed in a makerspace and you can never have too much duct tape, she says. <laughs> and then she says, if money is tight, focus on things that you can buy a lot of for very little money. And she gives the example that she can get 100 assorted LED lights for only $2.20 on eBay. And the same article recommends creating a library makerspace as a marathon, not a sprint. It will take time to build an awareness in your community about what a makerspace is and why people should use it. And I can vouch that that is true. One of the libraries in my district, which is larger and which does have some funding and got some tremendous funding from a grant to be able to create quite a nice makerspace with the high-tech equipment, uh, it took them a while to convince their community hey, we've got this resource, come and use it. This is how we will show you. So it is about community, regardless of what you implement in your makerspace. I love this quote. This came from a director in my area. And she kind of said this in passing at a county meeting, but it's so true. Makerspace is a fancy word for craft area, she says. So I have to ask you, how much space does a makerspace take if a makerspace could take space? Anybody want to chime in with the answer there? What do you think? How much space do you need for a makerspace? A table. A table. They peeked at my slides, Jean. A six-foot table. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There's the table. This is from a library that has a population of less than 1,700. And this is what the director of this library says. She calls this her makerspace, and the response has been outstanding. She says, we have a roll of drawing paper with crayons and markers, Lego and Duplos, loom bands, origami, duct tape crafts, connects, magnet tiles, and snap circuits. In the four hours we were open yesterday, all but two sets were used, some more than once. And here's what else she says. Pay attention to this. I just want to encourage other smaller libraries not to be too intimidated by the idea of a makerspace. And remember, it can be any size and include all kinds of things. So there you go. Good advice from the director of the Prairie City Public Library. That was from one of the original presenters of this session. And there are her makerspace kits. They're just in a box. She took a shelf that formerly had um, 
reference materials on it. And because the library didn't need those reference materials, they weren't being used because they have all the databases and things, um, that she reconverted it, turned it into her makerspace. And these are um, just a few ideas that I have heard from many librarians that they say, if you're going to invest in something for a makerspace, invest in these magnetiles. Everybody brags about these magnetiles. There's also a light table that if you have a place to put it and the uh, expenses, the budget to be able to get it, that goes with these that makes it even cooler. But they all say you don't have to have the light table to use the magnetiles. And then the snap circuit sets, those are always a really popular item as well. One thing that Prairie City Library has recently started to do is uh, implement these adult learning kits. These are simply bags that have materials inside on how to learn or do an activity. They have one on disc golf and yoga and bird watching and cake decorating. And there's one there you see on the top left on how to play the ukulele. Interesting story here about how a small library has made a difference, not just in the life of a patron or two, but in the life of the community. So this library has this ukulele kit, and uh, one of the board members, her daughter, actually wanted to buy a ukulele. She was interested in, in playing ukulele. And this board member said, oh, don't buy one. The library's got one you can check out. Go check it out, see if you like it, and then if you do, you can buy one. So that's what this teen girl did. She checked out the library's kit. She learned how to play ukulele because of this kit, and she loved it. So she returned the kit, bought her own ukulele, and started playing. She convinced her two of her friends to do likewise. They checked out the kit, learned how to play ukulele, went and bought their own ukuleles. And now these three young ladies play regularly at the farmer's market and uh, countywide. They played for their Relay for Life. They call themselves Ukes for Cancer. And every time they play, they accept donations that they put toward cancer research. So what a fascinating and, and truly encouraging and inspirational story, I think, of how this small library is making a difference, as I said, not just in the lives of these girls, but in the life of the community. So this kind of ties in. This quote fits with what one of you said earlier. Size is relative. It's not your potential. This is uh, from the Slater Public Library here in Iowa. This is the director who said makerspace is just a fancy word for craft area. She has a wonderful um, multi-paragraph spot on their website. And I, I don't usually put so much text on a uh, slide, but I wanted you to have this information because I think it is so good that you have a choice as a small library. You can either cede your mission to the larger libraries in your, your vicinity, the larger major metro areas, or you can strive to find ways to provide service to your patrons where they live. And I really like this. She goes on to say, uh, by promoting what we have to offer and building relationships within the community, we have seen huge increases in the number of people being served and are even drawing people to our small library from the surrounding area. So I think that's wonderful. This is an example of some story time centers that are done at that library. And you can see the kids are having a blast. And you can also see that many of the materials used here are very inexpensive. The top left, those are nuts and bolts, large size nuts and bolts purchased for pennies, I think, at a hardware store. Uh, the second from the right, those are pool noodles. And it's drop the marble in and see what bucket it goes into. And then on the lower right, the little um, marble path or ping pong ball, I think they used, those are toilet paper rolls from off of the giant industrial sized toilet papers. So be creative. This library has also done a tween reading program. They partnered, this was one of the first they did where they partnered with their historical society and did a cemetery walk in conjunction with that title of the book. And since then they have collaborated with other librarians in the area to do a countywide teen program that has grown every year, and they are now in, I believe, their fourth or fifth year of doing this. This is what this library's space looks like. It's a, a nice size space. It's not a huge library by any means, but they do have this nice little area here, uh, comfy area here. And what they do is move the furniture out of the way. So like I said, put it on wheels or make it lightweight and movable. And once a month, they clear out that furniture, and they bring out some tubs, and they bring out some equipment, and they do a card making program. Uh, that's a lot of fun for the people who attend. So you can see how they've converted the space. They've also used that same space to do a soup and sound lunch. This is a cool program because the library started to do this after a local organization that had formerly been furnishing lunch for seniors was no longer able to do so. 
so the seniors lost out on this meal and they lost out on the socialization aspect and the library said we can pick up the slack and the librarians bring in crock pots of soup they invite local people oftentimes students to perform a little musical background and it becomes a really wonderful event for the seniors in that community this is what that library's makerspace area looks like. I uh, have It's very similar to what the other library was doing, but I just put it on here because she actually catalogs everything. Another one of those original presenters from Story City Library commented that you don't have to be big to think big. Another really good quote that I hope you're going to jot down. This particular library, as I said, Story City, they have a lot of retirees and senior living facilities. So I think this is a good example of showing what small libraries can do with some outreach and uh, meeting senior needs. They have three different programs that they do. The first one is where they have a, a, a book cart that they don't need to use anymore in the library, and they have a librarian pick out some books. Then they have a volunteer who takes those books uses that card and goes up and down the halls and stops to visit with people and, and share books. They do another program, they just call it the shared bookcase, and this is where the bookcase is permanent at the facility, but the library rotates books with a depository there. And again, they utilize volunteers to go and swap those books out. And the Memory Maker program, I think this is a really cool outreach program. This is kind of a storytelling event for seniors. So the librarian, or you could train a volunteer to do this too, picks a theme and then finds a short story or part of a book to read that fits in with that theme, shares her personal memories about it, and then asks the other participants to share their memories. So for example, you might talk about your first car or what you remember um, from celebrating your birthday as a child or your first day of school. and uh, the librarian commented that not everybody participates in the conversation. A lot of them do, but they all really seem to enjoy this. Somebody's asked a question about uh, the one of the last slides about putting barcodes on the tubs. That varies from library to library with the makerspace kits. Sometimes the library will just let you take the kit and you you bring it back when you're done using it. They use them in-house. Uh, some of the libraries do have barcodes on them so they know exactly who took them out. Um, now, as far as putting puzzles and games for check out, take out of the facility, I do know libraries that do that. And yeah, you sometimes count the pieces or you just trust your, your people to tell you, hey, there was a piece missing in this and just count it as a loss. So there are different ways that you can do that. Uh, the same librarian that does the senior outreach, she says, as her two pieces advice, number one is just ask. Ask for what you need. If you tell the community what you want to do, they will often step up to bat. Tell them what you need and they will provide it for you. My suggestion is to consider having a wish tree and you could maybe use a, a pine tree at Christmas time or a, a twig tree in the winter or the spring and you can have little slips of paper on it that people can take and they can purchase the items that you have there. You could also use a big decorated chalkboard or some kind of other eye-catching sign and post what you need. I would encourage you to have an obvious designated collection area for those items. And if your community is big enough, maybe have a couple of collection areas at various other businesses and locations in your town. She also encourages using recycled materials whenever possible because that's going to conserve money uh, as well as help you go green. So here are some examples from her of some programs that she's done for tweens and teens. This one on the left, the uh, junk robots, she has local electricians and contractors save some of their scraps. And then the kids get together and put together these funny little robot characters. And then on the right, she has a local farmer that agrees to grow small pumpkins for her. And then it's just junk that the kids take and they put together and kind of like the Mr. Potato Head type of activity. Um, but it's a ball and they do this as annual events. So kind of fun. Uh, here's another library idea um, and two reasons why I like this idea. Number one, this director took this idea directly from a large multi-branch system and incorporated it into her very small library. And she also adds, and this is her quote, this is an idea that likely cannot be done in a bigger library or city. 
what she did was um, this was the year that summer reading was uh, the theme was all about superheroes. She took the idea from the large library where the large library was giving these uh, I'm a super reader sign to all the kids who had completed summer reading. And she said, well, I can't begin to do that with all my kids. I can't afford that. So what she did instead was she had a nomination process, just a very simple form that people could nominate someone in the community who was doing great things, but was typically overlooked. And she did, I think, five or six weeks worth of this during the whole time of summer reading. So once a week, a new person was chosen as the community hero. They were honored at the library and given a sign to put in their yard. So kind of an interesting little way to acknowledge some of those people in your community that are doing wonderful things. Here are a few ideas from a really tiny library, 386 people in this community, 2,100 square feet. And this was a fundraiser that they did, an ugly sweater contest, kind of a creative thing. You can see they don't have fancy space. They just hung these things all around the walls. Um, but they did this as a fundraiser, as I said, and they had people purchase tickets. I don't remember what they charged, 50 cents or a dollar per ticket. And people would vote on their favorite sweater. This library also regularly does community fun nights. And uh, with the exception of the lower left picture, those activities are happening in this library. And yes, it's crowded when they do these because I've been in this library when about half that many people are there and it's cramped then. So it's got to be like sardines in there when they have this many people, but it works and it brings the whole community together. Another thing I want to encourage small libraries to do is to collaborate because this small library is located in a county with, um, I believe it's six total libraries, the majority of which are teeny tiny libraries, one person libraries. And they collaborate together to do three large countywide activities every year. They do a, a toddler fest every year. And then they partner not just with each other, but also with countywide organizations that cater to preschoolers and have different activities and uh, specialized things for preschoolers. And they put this on in the big community center that's located in the county. And then they do a teen activity every summer. They have, or actually they do this in the fall, I think. They have a movie theater that allows them to come in and see whatever movie is coming out that's based on a book and the teens get to see the movie before the public does. So, of course, that's really a cool thing for the teens to do. Then they also do a countywide uh, read program, and all of the librarians pitch in, and they all help to promote these, and they utilize shared funding that they get from their county supervisors. And one way that they've managed to always maintain and or get increases in their county funding is that they approach their supervisors by saying, here's what we're doing collectively. And on all of these activities, the promotional materials have something that says, this event is sponsored in part by your county supervisors, by your green county supervisors, and the supervisors like that. So there's some tips for you on some uh, ways that you can collaborate. They also bring in a summer reading presenter, I think a couple of them every year, about, because they, they pool together, they work together. So that's probably a, a, one of the best things I can tell small libraries. If you want more bang for the buck, work with the other libraries in your area. So in our remaining time, let's just bring this all home and put your thinking caps back on. Here's a big library idea, library cafes. They're really cool, they're fun, they'd be great to have in a small library environment, but you don't have the space, you don't have the staff. How can you take a library cafe idea and make it work in a very small library environment? Give you some time to post in the chat box while I take a sip of water here. <laughs> uh, Melissa says we put out a Keurig and a study carol. Keurigs are popular. Yes. Make it a once a month event. Mm -hmm. I have a fellow director who has a Keurig machine and offers pods to the people. I like ah. the way that sounds. Nice. <laughs> You talked about the once a month event. There's a library I know of that uh, the local coffee shop closed. And this was hard on the community because this was where the seniors went to socialize and congregate. Mm -hmm. And so the library decided that once a week they would do a coffee conversation. And they open up the library and they have coffee and the seniors come and they, they socialize, chit chat, talk about everything mm -hmm. from the weather to politi politics. Yeah. So it's almost like a community conversation. 
All right, there were a few more that had scrolled past me. Hold on a second here. Um, let's see. Um, I have a fellow director who has gone to a coffee house and actually made its own coffee blend, and they sell it to the library and offer it to the patrons. Oh, nice. Um, yeah. It's a good um, collaboration. Yeah. Um, our friends of the library donated a Keurig, so we keep a coffee bar on an old book cart. Mm -hmm. um, we have coffee and conversation once a month. Our turnout is awesome and always looked forward to. Nice. Um, let me see. There were a few more in here that I missed. They kind of went by fast, lots of them. Our friends yeah. have a coffee cart with complimentary coffee, tea, and hot chocolate. Um, we, uh, let's see, uh, we always, this is Melissa. We have it out always and charge $1 a cup, so it's a great money raiser. Um, Karen says they have Saturday morning coffee and books. Mm -hmm. Great ideas. Thank yeah. you for sharing. Yeah. I Here's think another one. <laughs> This one was done at that summer reading session that I talked about in one of my opening slides. This was where you take a beach ball, you have different questions on it, and you throw the beach ball to each other across the room. And when you catch the ball, you look down, and whatever question is there, that's the one you have to answer. And we had several small library directors and staff say, we could never do this in our environment. We don't have room to toss the ball around. That's for big libraries. Well, how could you take this idea and use it in a small library environment. What could you do instead? Oh, I'd like this one. Um, I'm seeing what Patty said that Leah shared with me that mm -hmm. she actually goes to the McDonald's once a week and talks to the coffee group. That's a great outreach. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Melissa says you could roll it. If you're at a table, you could roll the, the ball. Yeah, you don't have to throw it in the air, right? Yes. Uh, Whitney says a jar with questions to pull. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And Kelly says the same thing. Um, I, I'm not sure what these are, but she says cootie catchers. Oh, yeah. That's like the things you made in school where you out of pay. I know what those are. Oh, OK. <laughs> um, have it at the circ desk. And while they are checking out, they answer one question. It helps staff get to know patrons. Oh, that's a great mm -hmm. idea. Yeah. I uh, Jean, that. yeah. And Jean says use a smaller beach ball. That's true. <laughs> yeah, wonderful. Going back to the coffee, I see um, Leah shared that Carolyn talks about doing a monthly coffee with a cop. I just did a webinar that was all about libraries partnering with Leos, and uh, that's a wonderful thing if you can do that. So there are lots of ways you can do the toss the ball. Here's another one for you, author visits. Authors are expensive. You need space because they usually draw a fairly decent crowd. How can small libraries conduct an author visit. Local authors, Melissa says. Right. Definitely start there. <laughs> Any other ideas? Um, highlight a certain author and possibly set up a chat online with them. Mm-hmm. Um, local authors and a regional bookseller group. Oh, nice. Partner Good with, idea. yeah, partnering with schools. Yeah, if you partner with the school, maybe you could bring in a children's author or a, um, a young adult author. Mm -hmm. um, new authors that are adverti advertising for a new book. Oh, that's good. One of my library systems did that with, um, I can't remember his name, but it was the author of Marley and Me. Oh, this was yeah. back when nobody had heard of the book. And the author, the library director read his ARC copy and loved it and contacted him immediately to bring him in, got him for peanuts, and now he charges a fortune to toss. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So it's always good to ask. Even. Yes. Okay. Right. Use a community room somewhere else in town, but sponsored by the library. Good idea. Nobody said Skype yet. You kind of alluded to that with a chat. Mm -hmm. Um, some other things that some libraries have done, smaller libraries, is they find online recordings of interviews with the authors. Those are readily available nowadays, and you make that just part of your overall scheme if you're focusing on a particular book. So um, I see that Leah tells me that somebody asked, can we get a bulleted list of those beach ball questions? I actually don't have those questions. Um, that was an idea presented by somebody else, but you could ask any kind of question. I think some of them... Let me just flip. I think we got enough time. You know, what instrument would you like to play? What is your favorite TV show? Um, do you usually buy your lunch or eat in the cafeteria? You, know, you could just get creative. 
maybe even ask your teens to put some questions in and then review those before you use them, of course. <laughs> but um, So let's look at a few resources that can help you with uh, moving forward with some programming kinds of ideas in small libraries. ALSC, which is the Association for Library, Children, um, Library Services to Children, a division of ALA, has this, uh, this site called Programs for School-Aged Kids. It's a kickstart page. Now, they don't give you a lot of details. These are just kind of ideas to be brainstormed. And one of them on here attracted my attention because I have a granddaughter that loves horses. And that's their bits and bri or Bit and Bridle program. It says, discuss a great horse book and complement it with fun horse-related activities. Bring, a ho bring horse equipment in for a demonstration. So what could you do in a small library? Horse equipment's big. Horses are even bigger. What can you do? in a small library to have a horse-related program. And I think someone in the audience shared an icebreaker resource that you might be able to use um, for your beach ball questions. So mm -hmm. thank you for doing that. Um, Whitney says, work with local FFA and 4-H. Wonderful. Both great organizations. Take it outside with horse blankets. Mm-hmm. That's a good idea. Or even have the real horse on the outside if you've got a park or something. Mm -hmm. Local veterinarians. Oh, that's a good resource. Briar horses. Oh, I think oh, those are the little the, models. The, I think. Yes. The little yeah. stand, yes. Mm -hmm. um, have a farrier speak. Mm -hmm. the, yeah, the person that actually puts on the horseshoes. Mm -hmm. Maybe you could incorporate a horseshoe craft along with that. Yeah. Uh, Jenny says uh, uh, county fair, so working at fair time. Mm -hmm. You could even do just a, a basic display on a bulletin board of different horse breeds and maybe make that a, a more of a passive program where they have to guess the horse breed and lift the flap to see what it is or maybe write down answers. You could even turn it into a contest. Um, I had thought if you use a sawhorse, and get some actual tack from a horse owner, put a saddle on the sawhorse and the kids could sit on it to get the feel of the saddle and you could do that as a photo op. All the kids get their picture taken on the sawhorse. Uh, some other people have mentioned using stick horses, which could be fun. Uh, and of course, there are all kinds of crafts I'm sure you can find online for doing that. If you're not familiar with ARSL, you should be. It's the Association for Rural and Small Libraries. Every year they do a conference this past year it was in Springfield, and this coming year it's going to be in, um, where is it, uh, Burlington, Vermont, I believe. And they also have a listserv, which I think is a pretty important feature because it's specifically for rural and small libraries. And on this listserv, you can ask questions, get information, share ideas with people who understand what it means to be in a small library. So I encourage you to check that out. The programming librarian, which comes out of the American Library Association, has a browse ideas at the top of their menu tab. And from there, the drop down will allow you to choose by budget. And notice the first one on there is free. I like free. Um, you can choose by library type, topics, and then your audience. So that's a really good resource, too. They have some creative ideas on there. The internet. <laughs> Talk about information overload. If you type in, just do a, a Google search for small public library ideas, put that all together, you will get so many ideas you won't be able to keep up. Many of those ideas will come from Pinterest. I don't actually have a Pinterest account, but I'm told it is a wonderful, wonderful site. I just prefer not to have yet another thing to have to check and have a password for. But if you're on Pinterest, uh, or if not, get an account and you can get all kinds of ideas, not just for programs, but for decorating, um, for crafts, for book displays, you name it, and you can get the ideas on Pinterest. I kind of alluded to this earlier. In my area, we encourage libraries to partner with the next water tower town, from water tower to water tower. These are usually spaced about 10 miles apart. So meet with those other librarians that are nearby in other libraries in your county or in your region or just down the road. Also, don't forget about your state library, because I'm assuming the Wisconsin State Library is like the Iowa State Library. They have lots of resources. They have consultants who will meet with you and give you some guidance. 
we have a, a statewide communication system. It's kind of like a listserv. You probably have something similar, and you can use that to bounce ideas around, watch for the training that's being offered in the continuing ed. And that brings us up to our question and answer time. I wanted to be sure we had plenty of time for questions and answers. So Jean and Lee, I'm going to be dependent upon you again to ask questions or to tell me what the questions are that the audience <laughs> asked. Thank you. Um, and thank you for all of those um, great resources and I program ideas and things like that. I think this is um, another example of sharing with your colleagues that you just mentioned mm -hmm. as um, everybody's sharing their ideas in, in today's um, webinar. So if you have any questions um, for Marianne, um, go ahead and submit them anytime. I'm just going to scroll back through the what's come in so far to see if I've missed anything. One question that I just had this discussion last week with some librarians in, in smaller environments was how can I get people to show up for my programs and specifically they were talking about adult programs they had trouble getting adults to participate and so we talked a lot about marketing I know in smaller libraries that's often a, a tedious task because you're understaffed and often your staff doesn't always have the knack for graphics and creating attractive signs and such. You don't have the budget for that. One thing I will say is that if you, most libraries I think have um, Word or something similar or Microsoft Office or something similar to it, you can create some really attractive posters in PowerPoint. And that's what I use for my slides here. So you just take one slide and you turn it into a poster, put an attractive graphic on it. And I have to say the clip art is greatly improved from what it used to be. Um, have a few text words of text on it. You want to keep it simple. Put your library name and logo and address on it. And there you go. You've got a poster that you can save it as a, a JPEG and turn it into a photo so that you can use it for social media. You can print it out and use it as a poster. You can send it as an attachment by email. So that's one way of uh, making some inexpensive marketing signs. The other thing I would say is personal invitations go a long way. Um, get some postcards, print out what your program is, add a little handwritten note, and send those to 20 or 30 of your most loyal patrons and personally invite them. We did this once at a very tiny library where I used to work, and we got the participation, and people were just tickled that we had sent them an invitation like that. Any other questions have come through, Jean? Um, <clears throat> yes, um, well, a couple of comments, too. Melissa says um, that Facebook has been their best way to advertise um, mm -hmm. for programs. It's and, free. Yes, um, and Canva, and we talked about a little bit about that right. one earlier. <clears throat> right. um, and uh, Melissa also suggests getting an email list for weekly alerts about what is going on. So, like, the mm -hmm. library would have an email list. Right. Yes. Yeah, maybe an e-newsletter of some type. And there's so many resources on, you mentioned Canva, but there are a lot of resources on that will help not just with publicity, but also with those uh, email kinds of things, like MailChimp, I know is popular mm -hmm. among some nonprofits. Yes. Um, they're easy to use and they're cheap. They're, they're usually free. Yes, I think they're free usually up to a certain number, and right. then especially for nonprofits and libraries, mm -hmm. I'm sure they would just be a discount, discounted mm -hmm. price. Um, any other comments or questions um, from anyone? We have a few minutes left um, before one o'clock go ahead and share my contact information there okay. feel free to send me an email if you want any of the information I shared miss something or have a general question for me I'll be happy to uh, supply you with the answers uh, that I have and the resources that I mentioned and Excellent. I know copies of the slides are going to be available for all of the attendees correct Correct. Yes, they will be posted most likely by tomorrow for sure, but they might mm -hmm. even be up later tonight. So, um, And so yeah. if there are no other questions, and we've got a few minutes, I have a question for the audience. Sure. What is one of your most successful programs or um, it could be a, a resource that you supply at your library that you have done in your small library? And I'm assuming all of you attending are parts of small libraries. So. Just put in the chat box, what's your most successful, most successful idea, let's say, that could be a program or a resource or um, a way to juggle staff uh, to cover everything? What's your best idea? Uh, cooking for one or two with a speaker from UW oh, Extension. Nice. 
We raised twelve thousand dollars with a biker chicks, and it's B Y K E R C H I X calendar. Ladies over fifty in leather. <laughs> oh my <is> goodness! Awesome. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. So, did you sell the calendars, and that's how you made that much money? That's a lot of calendars to sell. Yeah, I'll see what she says. And I'm um, assuming and these were local people that were in the calendar. I would assume so too, but we'll we'll see what Melissa says. And I was going to say I will talk to Jamie about this because there are so many um, great ideas in the question and in the chat that mm -hmm. I will see if we can pull all that out and put it and make that in a separate oh, that's document. Wonderful. Yeah, that's what um, I like about this that, that you're all sharing ideas too, and that that's yeah. what I encourage you to do regularly. Uh, Melissa says, ladies came up with uh, $500 for the honor and had a matching person, and then we sold them. We are Gary Biker, B-Y-K-E-R, library, and there was a new Harley shop in town. So that was oh, that is how great. creative. That is awesome. That, that um, wins the prize for the best idea I've ever heard. <laughs> Um, Alexandra says teen programming with Magic the Gathering, Dungeons and Dragons, and focused thematic crafting like Star Wars. Ah. Yeah. Um, this one, let's see, I can back up. Uh, pyrograph, pyro, pyrography, I'm not trying to say it, pyrography classes. That's about starting similar, fires. <laughs> yeah, similar to wood burning, only done on lichen type fungus, which is dried in an oven prior to the class. I have never heard Why? of that. Interesting. That cool. Um, let's see. Um, we are not a small library. Successful idea. Um, Family Fortnite a few years ago brought in 90 people. It took me about 30 minutes to prep. However, this year some people thought it was Fortnite gaming, so we need to change the name of the program. <laughs> um, folks bring their um, own blankets, pillows, uh, turn uh, turntables, and chairs, and bookshelves. Oh, uh, sorry, let me turn say that again. Yes, right. they turn their tables and chairs and bookshelves into tents. They check out books and read. I take Dixie cups of snacks around to everyone during the quiet reading time. Wow, that's, that's awesome. interesting. Yeah. Um, family movie night with popcorn. Whoops, and uh, we present this in the evening so uh, parents can participate. Um, Sorry, they're coming in fast now. I'm scrolling past them. We had a yoga for kids class, uh, very well attended. The yoga instructor volunteered her time and brought all the necessary supplies. Mm -hmm. um, cement leaf casts. So, ah, yes. that sounds interesting. That sounds yeah. like an outdoor activity. Yes. <laughs> um, we served homemade cookies every Friday with coffee after a few years and many recipe requests. We had a, fry, a cookbook made, Friday Favorites, which ended up being a big seller. Wow, nice. Yeah. Um, Fandazzi Fire Show. I'm not sure if I'm saying that right, so I apologize if I'm mispronouncing that. Fandazzi Fire Show in the park brought in several hundred people. Uh, Whitney says they are doing a fortnight in March. And I hope it's su successful for them as well. Um, family book club for Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. We had a local oh. chocolate shop create mini chocolate bars with the golden ticket in one of them. Oh. And the winner got a tour of the chocolate shop's kitchen. Oh, fun. <laughs> what a wonderful idea. Yeah. And they're again a great partnership activity. Yeah. Um, Karen says we invite folks from the DNR to do programs. They bring the supplies to talk about Wisconsin fur bears. They talk about bats and they bring real bats. Right. If you haven't yet partnered with your 4-H, with your extension, I should say, or with your county conservation or your local DNR, those are wonderful resources for programming. Mm -hmm. um, Carolyn says they do an annual pie auction with donated pies from local bakers as a fundraiser. Mm. Well, thank you. I always enjoy hearing from other libraries about what you're doing because as a consultant, that's a lot of what I do is I take other ideas from libraries and share them with more libraries. Um, <laughs> that's a big part of my job is sharing ideas. So that's this awesome. Is awesome. Thank you. You're welcome. There's one one more silk scarf dyeing and scarf style show. Hmm. I like that one because I'm terrible at scarves. So <laughs> yeah, I have a lot of scarves. I just love them. And, and some people wear them so wonderfully. And every time I put one on, it looks like a noose. It just doesn't. <laughs> Yeah, I need to be nice for me. <laughs> I need to go to that scar the style show. Mm -hmm. um, Don says one summer we used only local resources for the summer reading program. Um, the health department did healthy eating, local rock hounds did a display and flint napping, police did a detective presentation and much more. Um, 
That's awesome. And Karen said they did a scarf swap too. I like that. So that's a good idea. Um, Karen says we do an annual fundraiser called Loud in the Library and do it on a Saturday night after the library closes, adults uh -huh. only. So there are games and demos and drinks and music. Yeah, the adults only programs are getting more popular and those can be wonderful ways to re uh, reach the 20 and 30 year old crowds. Mm -hmm. um, one of you mentioned about Facebook being such a great resource. One of my libraries, uh, they still kept their Facebook page, but they also created an Instagram account. And the director said, I cannot believe the 20 and 30 year olds are showing up at the library now because they're the ones that are on Instagram. Oh, good I'll idea. Keep that in mind. Good to know. Um, and we did, yes, we did just hit one o'clock. So um, I think we will. Um, call it uh, a good. That was an awesome presentation. Thank you to everyone for your participation yes. and sharing all of your ideas. Um, I will talk to Jamie and we will um, do our best to get all the ideas pulled out and into another document up on the website later, um, probably tomorrow as well. So thank you so much, Marianne, for a great presentation. Thank you and definitely thank you to the audience. Um, as we mentioned, the session um, has been recorded and the slides and the recording will be posted on the conference website by tomorrow. And our closing session is at 2 o'clock today with Sarah Houghton. We hope you can join us. And if not, we hope you have a great rest of your day. And we will see you in January of 2020 for the next Wild Wisconsin Winter Web Conference. Thank you.